Oh, we're rolling. Okay. Oh, shit. Oh, okay. All right. Are we rolling? We are rolling. Yes, there is no good. beeping. I'm kind of concerned about that. Hello and welcome to Word Up Podcast. I'm Evie. And I'm Webster. And today we are with famous, infamous, the man of the hour, the man of the ha- camera behind the camera and stage. I don't know. The man of many skills. I like the hour, the man of this hour. Yeah. Just this hour. <laughs> or slightly less than an hour, yeah. whatever it is. So, Luke Davies, yes. welcome to our podcast. Thank you. It's deli- I'm delighted to be asked about the <laughs> podcast. Yeah. Yeah. How are you today? I'm great, thank you very much. Uh, surviving winter. It's always nice to have people um, turn up unexpectedly and sit around my table. Yeah. And You're welcome. here you are. <laughs> it's great to be here. Yes, yes, yes. So, so let's dive into your story. You sure you want to do this? <laughs> well, do. <laughs> we, we take our chances. <laughs> yeah, it's too late yeah. to turn back now, right? <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. So for our audience who don't know who you are, would yes. you mind explaining uh, your artwork and what you do? All right, that is a, it, it feels like a lot, doesn't it, to put, be put on the spot like that. Okay, so um, let's see. I have, a, uh, I have a video production business. So I make videos and uh, films, and um, uh, I also teach um, performance workshops. I have a little theater company that teaches um, uh, improv to uh, high school students. And, um, and uh, I also um, write some poetry, which I've been performing for the last couple of years. So, yeah, that's kind of a bunch of the things at the moment. How did the three interact? How did you come to be doing those three things? Yeah, okay, yeah. That, <laughs> that's quite interesting, I think. <laughs> Um, that's a that's a long story. It goes back a long way, but I think what it, what it does is like uh, identifying, um, you know, when I was younger that I'd like to work in a creative field, and that for me was was going to be television. Mm-hmm. And um, sure enough, I worked really hard and I got into television, and then found myself in quite a not particularly creative part of television. Right. That's not that's not true actually. I was in I was in post production for fifteen years, and actually it, it, it's. Uh, Collaboratively, it was a very, very creative working with producers, and and um, and it was uh, in that sense it was quite rewarding. But what, of course, what you're doing is you're working within a very narrow um, brief to satisfy particular requirements of like a show or a channel or a, a particular project. And so there was still a sort of cre- creative. Um, I still needed to find a, a different creative expression. Uh, I'd been in youth theatres when I was a kid and stuff, and that was uh, always satisfying. So I knew there was a performance aspect that I wanted to explore as well. So um, that that became theatre and improv, and um, and then uh, yeah, the 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 writing has been again. It's sort of one of those things you sort of think has been always been in the back of my mind quite idly thinking like, oh, yeah, I'll probably write something one day, or maybe mm-hmm. you don't, or you know, <laughs> maybe, it's a, maybe it's just a delusion, I don't know. But um, a, a couple of years ago, having uh, I went to see some spoken word for the first time, and having um, some experience of perform, having years of experience performing in a different, different way with improv and theatre, Seeing spoken word performers made me think, ah, now this is really interesting. This could be a new challenge. What I do is I think that I can bring something to this performatively. Um, All I would need now is the words to speak. Right. And so that was the point at which I thought, oh, yeah, no. So I will will set myself this challenge of, um, of writing. Yeah. And so that's where that has come in. So uh, it feels like you've traveled also a lot. You're you're not from around here, are you? <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, yeah. I don't know. I've traveled a lot. I've been all around the world. Yeah, you lived I, in Australia. Yeah. yeah. So I'm originally from Wales, and then um, I Which felt I'd in already UK. in the UK. I felt that I'd already traveled quite a lot um, by living in Wales and England. By the time I was um, eventually as an adult, I moved to London to work for the first time, and then. Um, I thought that was already quite a lot of traveling. I always mm. moved around as a kid, but then uh, 
uh, yeah, then I married an Australian woman and ended up living in Sydney, having children there. And then um, because we were both sort of uh, restless and traveling types, um, we thought we'd, we'd, we'd take a great adventure and go around the world. And uh, we made our first stop um, was Amsterdam. And actually, it sort of went a bit wrong at that point because we ended up staying in Amsterdam for forever. <laughs> uh, so it's been 12 or 13 years now. But, wow. um, this was only supposed to be the first stop on a great world tour. And, uh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> great <laughs> adventure, right? like, Oh, this is nice. Let's just stay here. Yeah. So that, I mean, that's what happened there, yeah. What attracted you to Amsterdam? Um, in, uh, Amsterdam was, um, it was actually somewhere I'd never been before. It, it, it sounded interesting. It sounded like, oh, this would be a fun place to be for a little while with small children. And there was an opportunity uh, for my ex-wife to work here. And it was like, oh, let's, we'll, we'll, we'll try that. Do that for a year. And I, I, as it turned out, it just became this sort of like, oh, this was a really nice place to be. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a little city. There's lots of things. Um, there's lots of creative uh, things happening. Culturally, there's lots of interesting things happening. Um, but it's it's not overwhelming like uh, like a big city like London where where we'd lived previously or Sydney where um, it's it's so enormous it always takes two hours to get everywhere and things like that. Suddenly you're in this place where you can just ride around on your bikes and it's family friendly and right. lots of cute things happening. So it just became, it felt like a good place to bring up kids and that's what we we uh, did. Yeah. So um, yeah, now the children are almost all grown up. And, oh. uh, yeah. So you are drawing some inspiration for your poetry from traveling, or what other things that inspire you? Uh, so what inspires me? No, I think I, um, I'm possibly <laughs> what's inspiring me right now. Um, I think one of the most uh, one of the most ex uh, things that I'm really enjoying about writing is has not been so much. Um, uh, I, f I felt when I started, I, uh, I, sorry, I, I mentioned already, when, once I started it was something It was something about the challenge of just writing something. How, how do I actually do that? Having improvised for so long or, um, or worked with other people in a filmmaking setting you know, for so long, working off with a script, and it's like, okay, how am I going to actually write something down? And that, that became, that was the initial challenge. What, what I found after doing that repeatedly um, was actually that the idea of um, having particular themes that I wanted to explore was not first and foremost in my mind. What I found by repeated writing was that certain things would come off the page and I recognized that there were themes that I was exploring mm. and I wasn't doing that deliberately. Right. Um, and um, so that actually became, <laughs> that became quite... Uh, that is still uh, ongoing and that's still a really interesting process. So um, some of the themes that I'm noticing that come out there, there's themes around mortality. I think that's because I'm getting older and my kids are getting older and the kids are a great um, uh, mirror by which you, you realize that time is passing, you know, mm -hmm. my, my kids are now... Um, uh, One's an adult and one's very nearly an adult, and so <laughs> and you go, like, "Oh right, yes, I've physically been along uh, alive a long time." <laughs> now my children are adults, and um, so then uh, so there's uh, things around aging and mortality, but there's also things around, um, um, and this is related to related to uh, traveling, and that's things around memory and landscape, the ideas of. Um, of, of home and nostalgia for home and, and a sense of belonging and things like that. Those themes are also coming up. Yeah. Um, another thing that I've noticed, uh, because I like to question myself and the work that I'm producing. Um, after I've done it, I th uh, for example, recently I noticed that I was um, exploring a, th a theme around a, a particular place in Wales that I associate strongly with my childhood. It's not where I, it's not where I lived, but it's where my extended family are from. And, it's, and I explored this through several pieces. So what I noticed 
after a few poems was that the poems themselves were rather were, were quite downbeat. They were quite um, um, they were meandering and they were slow and they were t- you know. And I thought, oh well, oh, okay, this is quite nice, but there's also not a lot of humour here. So what I'd like to do now is for my next poem, no matter what it is going to be about, I would like it to start from a place of being funny. Okay, mm. so then it became a challenge to to say, right, whatever it is I write now, and I have no clue what it is, this will be a funny poem. It will be just sort of like so again to set myself up in opposition and contrast to what had come before. And I find that's that's for me that's quite a useful um, technique for stepping into the next piece, next work. It's like, oh, let's let's explore this more because I'm interested, or let's uh, just put pause on that one and explore something. Completely different in a totally different style. Right. Interesting. And how do you experience all that on a stage? How How is your performing part? So writing is one part, right? And then performing. Do you find it easy to connect to your audiences? Yeah, um, I think it's, <laughs> I think the performing of the poetry has been a really, um, again, it's been a really interesting uh, experience a really interesting discovery for me because um, I feel that I have uh, um, years of experience as a performer and a, a, a hosting, for example, and, and lots of uh, tried and tested techniques that I have in order to connect with the audience. Mm. Um, and that's, that's, that's one thing. Um, finding the ways that uh, so that, let's say that that's as an, that's as myself as an individual right whether I put on a stage persona or I put myself out there which is a slightly more vulnerable thing to do but there's also the then discovering through the work when I'm writing um, what connects with an audience um, that's been a new that's been a new thing what language can really connect with the with, a, with an audience, what, what's the pacing that I need? The order of the pieces that I might read, in a, in a, if I'm given a slot where I can read two, three or four pieces, it's like the order that I present it to the audience is really important as well. Yeah. These are all things that I'm, I'm finding out and these are all really exciting. Um, I think um, because previously in other arenas I've tended to be on stage with other people at the same time, this is probably the first time um, that I've consistently been on stage in a, in a solo way, presenting solo work. And that has brought up a certain um, vulnerability for me as well and a certain anxiety and a certain set of discoveries associated with that as well. So um, uh, the feedback is very important. I've certainly... If, if there are certain people in the audience who I'll go and talk to afterwards, and uh, mm-hmm. or people will come up to you and offer um, offer their feedback, that's always really um, wonderful. If somebody if you've touched somebody in a particular way and they want to express that to you, I think that's a very humbling thing to do, um, a humbling thing to receive from a person. It's very generous of them. So all of that feeds into these um, into this. Uh, it, it is an exploration. It is a learning, a learning process constantly. Mm. I think it's worth. Um, uh, for me, it's really important to uh, keep ref- refining it, or keep ex- keep trying things, keep experimenting with things. Um, I don't feel like. Um, mm, I'll give you the example of like a, a stand-up comedian. I think that what stand-up comedy doesn't always appeal to me because I feel like there's a trap that a lot of performers fall into of repeating the same material each time, knowing they're set off by heart. Mm-hmm. It goes down pretty well. They repeat it. I think that the, it lock, lacks spontaneity. It lacks... It lacks... Um, it lacks uh, an organic spark of I think you recognize that it's not quite authentic that it's very slick or very well rehearsed and I think that often that performance can miss a, miss another way of connecting to the audience which is that the person is really just putting themselves out there and I think the audience really responds to that sense of human connection with somebody who they might see as vulnerable or nervous or whatever you know so I think if um so in that sense, I think, well, I'm not afraid to step out and just say like, okay, well, this is what's on my mind this week and these are the pieces I'd like to, to read and, and, and keep it exciting. 
Yeah. It sounds like um, you're in a constant state of, you know, developing your process and learning. Um, what are some of the milestones that you think uh, were instrumental in helping you get to where you are today for, you know, people who are thinking about getting started in poetry or uh, performance, spoken word and the such? Yeah, I think that there's an old um, <clears throat> well, there's an old adage around, um, um, I suppose you can you can apply it to, to you can apply it to a lot of the um, creative fields, but I think I first heard it in the in the uh, I think I heard it first for writing and then for acting. I heard somebody say like, "Oh, I want to be a writer," and they said, oh, "Okay, we'll just write." Yeah, yeah, and then somebody else says, like, oh, I want to be an actor. And they said, well, just act. <laughs> okay, in a sense, <laughs> we'll just let no. Um, yeah, that, I think that the... Um, I... I have a, I have a, I have a sense that it, with, with the, like, again, we, we talk about creative expression. I think, um, I think that eventually, if something needs to come out, it will come out. It will find its channel and it will emerge. Right. I think that I know a lot of people who are afraid to explore the thing that they most want to do because they're afraid to fail. We, we, this is kind of well. We talk about this a lot, right? You hear about it every day <laughs> with inspirational memes on uh, Instagram. But um, <laughs> yeah, so we have this. We, there's a fear that we won't be won't be good enough. Now, what's quite what's quite interesting is like um, lately one of the, one of one of the uh, in, in, um, one of the experiences I have is I have children now who are growing up, and um, <clears throat> so when children are small. They have a tremendous creative and imaginative force, but they don't have necessarily physical, cognitive um, skills and refinement to achieve very high end work. Okay, <laughs> so <laughs> what happens is they have a vision of a of a of perhaps a, a painting they'd like to to do, or something they'd like to write, and they have the gr tremendous energy to start it and then they, then eventually they might either they will get it to a certain point and then they might leave it or they might get frustrated and the frustration comes in when they think like oh it's not as good as the thing that I wanted to do mm -hmm. okay so <laughs> now the fact is that they have the energy to start it and that's really exciting mm -hmm. so I think but but when adults have these creative pursuits they think oh it's not going to be good enough they have an idea of what they'd like to produce being somehow good enough, um, measured against the sta an arbitrary standard of, of their own imagination. Okay, this is what it should be like, right? right? And then if they think, well, I can't possibly achieve that, so I won't, I won't do it. Okay. So now, one for me, one of the challenges is to is to imagine that, like, think, like, well, why would? And I've had this when I've taught, um, I've taught adults. Uh, improv in workshops and over courses and what I found ha what I find is that people say like okay well there's a standard I'd like to reach and I'm not there yet uh, so I'm going to be very angry and frustrated with myself and, and I, th <laughs> I think well if you don't do the work right ultimately if you don't do the work and expose yourself to the practice of doing it then you won't make any discoveries and it might well be and you know, it's not a very popular thing to say but it might well be that you're just not very good at it right <laughs> you're, you're never going to be very good at it okay yeah. mm -hmm. not everybody's going to is going to be a tremendous nobody, not everybody's going to be a good actor not everybody's going to be a great brain surgeon not everybody's going to be a f wonderful singer okay so that you might be complete your your aim might be completely unrealistic right but i don't think that it's not i don't think that it's not worth exploring because you'll find out the limitations we can't all be astronauts Okay, so <laughs> well. that, that's evident. <laughs> I've given up. I've given up any hope I might have had of becoming the next James Bond, <laughs> purely on uh, age grounds. Mm -hmm. Okay, so because <laughs> you have the looks. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, I think uh, I think it was David Niven played James, James Bond when he was in his sixties. So you never know. Okay, so, <laughs> so, but. The fact is that, like, there is, a, there is. I think there really is a thing for, like, okay, if we, let's let's talk about uh, the writing poetry, which I've come to fairly recently, is thinking like, okay, 
the only way for me the cri- the only criteria is like if I don't criticize it when it's going into the page I'll I'll write it and I'll ed- edit it and then I'll perform it okay but if I just let it be then the next stage is to put it in front of the audience and see if it lands see if it connects and what happens then is really really wonderful because you're just putting it out there and I really would encourage anybody to just think like it doesn't matter how afraid you are of doing it if you just make something and put it out there you'll be amazed the how generously people will receive it yeah and that's worth trying because that's yeah that's a wonderfully humbling experience mm, for sure there's a guy I follow on Instagram. Um, I can't remember his name now, but he's all about positivity and he's all about uh, putting out your content and, you know, just not being afraid of what people are going to think about it. Because for most of us, you know, if you're living in a creative field or you work in a creative field, you have this artwork that you think is good, but you're afraid of what other people are going to think about it. Yeah. So you limit the amount of output you have based on other people's imaginary beliefs yeah. uh, <laughs> of how good your work is. Um, and one of his things is, um, his quote is, uh, no one cares, work harder. Just put it out there. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's just some really good advice yeah, on how to move yeah, forward. Yeah, yeah, that's really so nice. So with that bravery note, I think you have something prepared for us for today. So let's hear it. All righty. <laughs> Angry man encounters cat and bird. Emerging onto the balcony one morning, the man, phone in one hand, cigarette in the other, discovers a large ginger cat defecating in an ornamental pot where his fine desert grasses grow. Outraged, he cries, get out of it, and lunges forward, aiming a kick squarely at the cat's behind. But the cat evades nimbly and flees along the railing. Hearing a cry from the neighbor's tree, the man turns to see a gull watching him. Narrowing his eyes, the man sees, as if for the first time, the bird's ridiculous thin red legs, webbed feet, and lack of arms. And you, he yells, can fuck off and all. The man throws his cigarette lighter at the bird. It misses, falling hopelessly into the gardens below, beyond sight, landing softly so that no sound is heard. The bird flies away. Some minutes later, the bird spots the cat sitting in the center of a decorative circle of paving stones. It comes into land, and for a moment the bird and the cat regard each other. Moss grows through the cracks. There is a distant sound of running water. The sun shines. The cat turns its head back to the sun, sniffs the breeze, and closes its eyes, wondering for a moment what it must be like to be able to fly. The bird looks towards the sun too, but it does not occur to the bird for a moment what it might be like to close one's eyes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing this. Was it inspired by actual events? <laughs> I thought it was a true story. I think I think you should write what you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's true. I do have a cat that comes onto the balcony. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and um, but I can't be on it at the same time as the cat, because <laughs> the cat doesn't 
trust. <laughs> <Me>. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so we share the balcony. It's an informal arrangement. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. It's working out. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's Amsterdam for you, right? Yeah. Birds and cats <laughs> informally. <laughs> Your, um, your, your uh, I guess, poem was very visual. You know, you're very detailed with the visuals, how it looked, mm. uh, what was happening, you know, frame by frame. Mm. Um, do you think that's influenced by your filmmaking? Because I was following the story in my mind. I was like, because you were describing the light of falling and then it lands softly on such mm. and such. Um, do you think that comes from you being a filmmaker? I think, I think it probably does. I, I don't think it's a deliberate choice. In the sense that, yeah, I didn't, I don't set out to write in, a, I think, a particular way. But this is a, again, this is part of the thing of having like um, uh, receiving comments from the audience or receiving comments from other writers and performers. Um, this is, there is something about that that I've heard that resonates that I've heard before. So I, I think, okay, yeah, probably I'm a, a visual thinker and. And again, it is these. Um, I, th I think that there's also there's also a legacy of poetry that I've read. And again, what um, and perhaps that I'm a visual, you know, a visual thinker of seeing the way that language creates these images in your head, of being aware of this phenomenon. And so, um, yeah, I can I can see that that's something that perhaps feeds back into the way I'm doing things as well. Um, I sometimes, like again, in the, in this one, there are certain details, and I don't know, I don't quite. I don't know, after I've written, because I, I write quite quickly, as well. I, I would say actually, I write very quick, quickly. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like to think about it too much at all. Um, and, but, and then often, I, when it, when I read it back and have the you know the replay process, the images occurring in my own head, it's like that's quite. Um, the, uh, in this poem, there's an image of uh, moss growing through cracks. And again, that evokes for me, you know, I mean, it, 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 it implies that time is slow and time is passing slowly. But it also, it, it does feel in, in, you know, clumsy way, it evokes sort of time lapse imagery of mm. uh, you know, nature programs and things like this. So I think that there is an element of. Um, I think, yeah, it's probably an inevitable leg legacy of working in film for so long. Mm. And you say you're writing fast, but um, when do you write? Do you have, like, your process? Do you, are you a morning person? Do you write evenings, mornings? No, I'm, um, um, I'm certainly not a morning person. Mm. Uh, yeah, that... Um, I've been trying to challenge that lately and it's not going very well. But uh, yeah, no, so the process for me is usually um, just before the deadline. It's, it's quite a good thing. Actually, the deadline has been a super uh, useful thing for me. So actually to go out and proactively seek, um, you know, this is something for other people too, but mm. to proactively seek an audience, to find a place to perform and have that deadline in place. Um, and then recognizing that it would be very easy at that point to say, okay, I have a performance, so I have this work already that exists mm. that I could go perform. But actually to say, mm, okay, on this date, at this time, I would like to present one new piece or two new pieces, for example, maybe read an older piece. Um, I'm finding that really helpful for just generating more stuff. Sorry, excuse me a moment. <laughs> Getting a bit caught on my wine. You mean water? <laughs> water. Red water. Okay, we'll take that one out. <laughs> take that one out. Yeah, there you go. Uh, yeah, so I'm finding that the, the the deadline to be a really useful device for getting me to generate right. new work. And so, um, and then, um, yeah, not and, and yeah, without any sense of shame or embarrassment, to say that actually, literally, the hour before I head to a gig would be mm. a good time for me to write something or um, I had a performance recently where I hadn't written anything new and I was going to perform an older piece and then when I got there I thought actually no there was something new I wanted to say this week so I wrote it oh, nice. um, in the bar before I went up so 
That was quite nice. So firm shout out for procrastinators everywhere. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but again, I'm just thinking like, okay, that has to be the, but the challenge comes from me mm. in the sense of saying, no, I will generate something new. Yeah. Because I can always rely on something old. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> so I've always got that on, on hand in, yeah. in my pocket. It's like, no, let's do something new this time. It's almost, it's sort of knock, it's sort of knocking up against the improv thing, which I have years of experience of. Right. And yet, there's something about this, um, this medium, the spoken word, where I'm not, I don't feel, I don't, know if it, I don't even know if it's ready, but I don't feel that I want it to be a complete improvisation on the stage, mm. but there, uh, there is something that I want to write down before I get up there. It's a different, it's a, it's a slightly different process for me. I'm not saying that that might not come in the future or that I might want to explore that, but it's not there yet. Right now it is about wanting to write something down. Um, to know, uh, yeah, to know that what what is that narrative path <laughs> mm. before I step up there? Yeah, yeah. yeah. everyone's got um, <clears throat> everyone's got a different process. Um, so I think you kind of have to just trust that, right? Yeah, because you've been doing it so long and it's yeah. working for you. Yeah, so far. Um, so there's something to be said for you know, even if it is maybe last minute and a bit improv-y, that's how you do it. Yeah, and the end result for the audience is just as good. So, you know, who cares if you wake up at 12 in the afternoon and write, uh, write a poem and then perform it, you know, four hours later in the evening. If it works, it works, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think, and I think that's um, one of the things that we can um, be thankful to the audience for is that the audience doesn't ask the question, well, how long did you work on this? <laughs> <laughs> Attaching some notion to the fact that, like, oh, if something took you, or did, is this a book that took you 20 years to write, mm -hmm. therefore it has more value than this Substance. thing. You know, we're, we're just, be, yeah, the, um, the audience goes in good faith to see these events and, um, um, and their expectations and... Uh, uh, high, you know, they want to be entertained or moved or whatever that is, and um, uh, you know that's a that's a generous thing f for them to do, and um, they want you to succeed. They want it. They want to be entertained or moved or whatever it is. Um, that's why they're there. So I think that that's a really nice uh, contract that we have with them, is that it's only when. You know, I mean, what's the worst performance you've ever seen? I don't know. Somebody <laughs> on stage forgets forgets their lines, or mm. um, or um, is totally inappropriate. Or if the audience becomes self self conscious or embarrassed by mm -hmm. the performance they're seeing, then then that's probably the only way it can go really badly wrong. Have you had moments where you like? What's the strangest thing that happened to you on the stage? I, will, I think that um, improv comedy is the, is the place where it was most likely to be, um, where you could push the envelope of what's appropriate, right? Or you could test 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 the audience in a way of being provocative, and seeing what makes the audience grow. Because I mean, if you're doing comedy, then you have a, you have this constant feedback from the audience of um, oh this, even to the point where you can sort of. Uh, detect what part of the room it's working in, right? So you go like, oh, that group over there likes risque humor. <laughs> this group over here likes intellectual humor. <laughs> so you can sort of play the room. Yeah. But if you want to, um, and then you can use, you know, you could use bad language or, or be deliberately pr provocative or off offensive and just see like, okay, well, how far can I push this this <laughs> audience and then trying that. And, and some of those, so occasionally, I think once or twice, I sort of, said something spontaneously and thought, oh, that didn't land well. <laughs> and then he said, well, I go, well, we don't need to do that again. Right. You know, we're not on a script. We're, we can, yeah, we can change it. And of course, um, some performers actually pers then pursue that further and that makes them a different sort of person to watch. Um, it's an interesting relationship because they want you to be good for their benefit. Yeah. And you want them to be good for your benefit as well. So there's like a push and pull, you know, 
but if you're not good, they're going to tear you apart and they're not going <laughs> to enjoy your poetry and that's going to affect your performance as well. So how do you how do you handle that, you know, knowing that, man, I really need to deliver for these people who've turned up and maybe paid money to come and see what I have to say? How do you deal with that in your head? I think I think it's... Um, uh, for me, the... Uh, for me, um, arriving with integrity. So that means, and that's just a set of my own, of having a certain set of my own rules, <laughs> certain or, or values. So um, one thing that's important to me is like, okay, well, am I stepping on stage with, with what I want to present? Now? Is, is it, if I set myself the challenge of a new piece, did I write it, right? Or am I, or am I just, if I, if, I, if I did that and I, Turn up, I've only got I've got three older pieces that I, uh, I feel lazy. And I think, okay, well, I'm not at my best. But fortunately, that doesn't happen so much. Usually, if I set myself the challenge, then that's then, and, I'm, and I say I'm going to write read something new, then I'll deliver on that promise that I made to initially to myself. Okay, so then the next thing is to go on stage with. Um, Probably with no alcohol, right? <laughs> not, 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 not be drunk. Yeah, okay. not, not a good <laughs> idea. <laughs> it's a record. It's a record. <laughs> you know, and then again, that might work for some performance and not for others. But for me, it's like, okay, so having had... Uh, I can have my social... If this is a social evening um, and I want to watch too, then I can, have my, I can have my glass of wine after the, after the set. Yeah. Okay, but f- until I've performed, I'll be on. I want to be completely aware. And once or twice, I've I thought, oh, it won't hurt. <laughs> Just have a couple of beers before I go on. And actually, I noticed the difference in myself. So it's like, okay, so that's not something for me. So I won't, won't do that either. So again, I think, but I think that as long as it's a bit like, um, you know, like the football fan who has his lucky pants and things like this. It's like, okay, well, if I get all the variables right, mm-hmm. my team will win. Okay, yeah, so, yeah. And, and to a certain extent, I think it's a little bit like that. It's like, let's... Nobody's giving us these performance rules. So it's like, okay, what well, we just have a set of criteria where I think I've done the best job to get on and treat the audience with respect and believe that there's something in the work that I'll do, that I've got the mix right, that will connect with them. And then also, if I feel like it, to explain that. I can ex- always take the extra step of saying, well, today I feel this, right? Okay, this is what's been going on for me today. And revealing something about the um, my personality, something that I'm really feeling. Um, for a long time hosting comedy, um, wasn't so much me on stage as a persona that I had a slightly more, a more confident, <laughs> more comedic, more ex- outgoing version of myself would go on stage. This is the character that I created and that, and I still draw on that person sometimes, but also now I'm becoming more interested in presenting myself, like private me on stage and seeing what happens there as well. Because I think by being authentic, when you present your work, again, you're giving the audience a further way of connecting. And not just, you know, and it doesn't just work in terms of the connection that they have with the performer on stage. It will, you know, you can, you, you will see people connecting with the people that they've come with in a different way because you'll have affected them in some way that they'll want to talk about it. Mm. And that's really interesting too. Yeah, for sure. And it's, it's the vulnerability that connects people, right? Yeah. Because then you also become in a way, quote unquote, responsible for that person because they shared something with you and you're responsible for that feeling in a way to hold space for that person to share. Yeah. Right? Yeah, it's really beautiful, I think. Well, I look forward to seeing your next performance on stage, Luke. Oh, thank you very much. And for our audience listening, where can they find you online? Right, well, I have my Instagram at Luke underscore Davis, D-A-V-I-E-S. (laughs) <laughs> with an E. We will yeah. spell it out. And spell it out on your Instagram. <laughs> yeah, just go to, your, go to your social and find me there. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, thank you very much. It's super fun. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. And for our audience listening, uh, as usual, you can find us on www.wordupodcast.com where you'll find our social media, past and present guests. And you can also make suggestions on guests that you think we should speak to. See you next time. Bye. Should I say see you next week? I should say see you next episode. Can I just add that? See you next time. See you next time. See you next time. See you next time.